Hello, thank you so much for joining us for this amazing session. I'm Erin Schertz. I'm the marketing manager of Roots Tech, and I have a wonderful guest with us today that we are going to learn so much from. This is Julie Stoddard. And Julie, hello, we're so glad to have you. Hello, thank you for the invitation. This is a really fun topic for me. Yeah, and we, we just feel so fortunate because as we've looked at how many, what classes are popular and what people want to see and, and what they're interested in, for over the last few years, Julie actually taught a class at Roots Tech a few years ago called Finding Your Elusive Female Ancestors. And it was the number one viewed class for finding women ancestors on Roots Tech. And so we were so excited when she said yes to doing a part two. So the original class is still on Roots Tech and you can find some amazing resources and tips. She's gonna share even more with us now. So this is really exciting and thank you so much for being here. Um, we also will be sharing any resources that she shares on RootsTech.org. So you can go there to find it. Share this video with anyone that you think might be interested in finding out more about this topic, about how to find your elusive female ancestors. And please tell us where you're from, where you're watching from. And also keep in mind that you can ask questions at any time. We will mostly be answering them towards the end of Julie's presentation. And um, if you have questions and you're watching the replay, please still ask them. We will get back to you and make sure that we get you any links that we talk about or any resources that we talk about here. So I wanted to properly introduce Julie because she's an amazing person and we're just so lucky to have her with us today. Julie Stoddard is, has a master's in family history and genealogy from Strathclyde and she did her thesis on DNA. That was after receiving her bachelor's in family history and genealogy from BYU. She is currently the project coordinator at BYU Center for Family History and Genealogy, and she's currently a Florida resident, which definitely relates to what we might experience tonight because she's in a storm. So we just wanted to give you guys the heads up that if any power goes out or anything happens, we will do our best to get back up right away and continue. And if Mother Nature doesn't agree, then we will redo the class, but hopefully we'll be good. So with that, I want to turn the time over to Julie and thank her again for being here. Please ask your questions and Julie, take it away. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And uh, this is a topic that almost everyone that uh, has spent more than a few minutes with family history runs into because we find that our um, research bumps us into these brick walls. As we go through this presentation, you will notice that the example records I use come from US records, which is where I do most of my research, but many of the principles apply to other countries as well. Let's review why women are harder to find in the records. In the early history of some countries, women came under the legal status of their husbands. So they weren't always going to the courthouse or being recorded in the documents. For the women who were married for most of her life, the records about her won't list her maiden name. Because of the challenges we run into while trying to identify women, it's important that we integrate three strategies to find records and evidence for the women in our trees. In the time that we have together today, there's only time to cover these ideas on a high level. So I have a copy of these slides and a more in-depth handout, which you can find at connectthebranch.com. One of the major considerations when researching women is knowing which records are most likely to name women. Roots Tech has a link on their site to my earlier Roots Tech class on finding your elusive female ancestors, which gives specific suggestions on how to narrow in on these records. One of the important things to think about is which records are most likely to be successful due to the record content and how easy they are to access, such as church records, which might have the content you need, but they're not always available online, and you'd have to go to a repository to find those. If you don't find the records you need in the records that you already searched first, then you can move on to these other records that are also likely to name women. So let's talk about how we can use DNA to help identify our female ancestors. 
There's two main DNA learning outcomes that I hope you come away with today. The first is that all four of the types of DNA can be used to research women. And then also we'll talk about five DNA strategies that can help you find more records or more evidence to identify your female ancestors. Because DNA is a more complicated topic, I encourage you to be patient as you're learning about DNA and continue taking classes and you'll find that the concepts begin to pull together and you can use it to find the evidence you need. Here are a couple of the blogs that I follow. They're all well explained and a great resource. I also use the International Society of Genetic Genealogy Wiki, which is a great list of terms and other examples. And there's also free classes at Roots Tech on DNA that are available still to view. And the Legacy Family Tree webinars have some free and some paid webinars. And then I also taught a class on beginning DNA at Roots Tech back in March of 2023. And the handout and slides for those are also available on connectthebranch.com. There are four types of DNA, and each of those have a unique inheritance pattern. And each of those can help in researching women. So we all have 22 autosomal chromosomes, which are shown here. And that's the autosomal DNA that are most popular DNA tests, such as Ancestry and MyHeritage. We also each have the sex chromosome, which for a man is an X and a Y, and women have two X chromosomes. And the fourth type of DNA is the mitochondrial DNA. So with mitochondrial, DNA, a mother passes the mitochondrial DNA to all of her children, but only the daughters can pass it on. And you'll notice here on the pink path that it's going down the female to female line. So if you want to use mitochondrial DNA for evidence on a line that's not your direct female line, then you'll need to target test another female to female line of descent. Because women inherit the X chromosome from both of their parents, but males only inherit the X chromosome from their mother, each gender has a separate inheritance chart, which can be found by searching for them online. But this unique inheritance path can also be helpful in solving research problems, such as with adoption cases. Just be aware that the X centimorgan counts are different than how you use the autosomal centimorgan counts for your evidence. So only males inherit the Y sex chromosome. So in order to use the Y DNA test to further your female lines, you'll need to find a male to male line of descent to test. This can be especially helpful when you're doing more distant genealogical brick wall research. So in this example, my research question is trying to find the parents of Agnes Gibson, but she and Robert were living in Pennsylvania in the 1740s and 50s, so the documents at that time period are not easy to find. So you'll notice that I'm the, a DNA test taker down in the lower left-hand corner, and then I found, following all the blue descent line down, I found a DNA possible test taker and I reached out to him and he was willing to take the Y DNA test for me. So autosomal DNA will be the DNA that we talk about most today just because that's the most common DNA test. And the inheritance for the autosomal is a little bit different. Each person inherits about 25 percent from each of their grandparents, and then that gets cut by about 50% each generation back. This means that not all of your distant cousins will share autosomal DNA with you. This is because of what is called recombination. So each time a child is created, the autosomal DNA recombines or shuffles the segments on the chromosome. For example, on the grandfather, you'll see that he has a light blue and a dark blue chromosome. And as his DNA is combined to create the figure there that is the father, those segments are recombined. So the father has the dark and light blue segments of the chromosome shuffled or recombined in a different manner. We'll see 
as we continue further down how these amounts of recombined DNA change the inheritance and thus changes the centimorgan count. So we have to consider that as part of the evidence. A uh, question I get asked frequently is where is the best place to test? And part of that answer depends on what your research question is or what you hope to get from DNA test taking. There are four of the major DNA testing companies, which are Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, MyHeritage, and Family Tree DNA. If you want to do the Y-DNA or the mitochondrial, then you'll need to use Family Tree DNA, which is the only company that tests those. You'll also notice on the second row that each of the different testing companies have a varied amount of test takers. And one of the strategies that some people use is they will take an Ancestry DNA test because they have the largest pool of matches. And then you'll notice that MyHeritage and Family Tree DNA will let you upload that DNA from Ancestry and then you'll have your DNA in three testing companies where you only paid for one DNA test. I do recommend that you test your oldest possible relatives to begin with. And also keep in mind that the DNA test kits come on sale often around the holidays. If you do choose to transfer your autosomal DNA to the other databases that allow it, you'll be able to find more DNA matches, which is sometimes referred to as fishing in all the ponds. So let's talk about centimorgans. The segments of DNA are often measured in centimorgans, which is not a measurement of length, but it's more a measurement of genetic distance or how likely it is to recombine. But as you're looking at your DNA results, you'll notice the centimorgan count is listed for each of your DNA matches. And why does autosomal DNA provide us evidence? The first principle is that the more centimorgans you share with a person, that means your DNA match is more closely related to you. So this image is of the shared centimorgan project, which can be found on DNA Painter. And it shows you what the average amount of centimorgans are for a relationship, such as the top one is a grandparent and on average, people will share 1,754 centimorgans with grandparent. But as you are able to input the amount of centimorgans you have with a specific DNA match, it can give you a list of possible relationships. The second piece of evidence from autosomal DNA comes from what we refer to as genetic networks, or they're also called a DNA shared match group. Notice that Rebecca there in the center on the largest blue circle has lines going out to each of her DNA matches. And some of those DNA matches also share DNA with each other. And the evidence that helps us comes because these shared match groups share what we call a most recent common ancestor. So the larger the genetic network is, the stronger your evidence is. Another way to diagram a genetic network is by this pedigree view. So each line in this pedigree begins with a DNA match. And then I wanted to see how much those DNA matches shared with each other. So I've listed the shared match groups along the bottom. And again, the fact that they're a shared match group means that they have a common ancestor which after researching each of these lines up, I was able to find that William, Marcus, and Martha were the most recent common ancestors for this group. What I really hope you come away with from this class is to start thinking about what strategies you can use with DNA. For example, if I'm doing US research and I start a new family, my instinct is to check the census records first. And we need to get in practice of when DNA can benefit our research. So let's talk about each of these DNA strategies one at a time. So the first strategy is if you're trying to prove a hypothesis for a maiden name. So for example, if you find a will and it says that Samuel's wife is Sarah, but it doesn't list her maiden name, of course, then you can search your DNA match list 
for that maiden name to see if your DNA matches have that name in their trees. A uh, second strategy for finding a maiden name is to use Ancestry's Through Lines tool or MyHeritage has their theory of family relativity. And these use the trees of our DNA matches to suggest relatives such as a parent or grandparent on our lines. We just need to remember that these trees of the DNA matches are based on the public member trees which may or may not be accurate, so we do need to verify everything. Sometimes as we are researching, we find a family that is in the correct location that we think our female ancestor is from, but we can't find the records to connect her to that family. So in this case, we should turn to DNA and use that to confirm those records. This is a client I was working on last month, and in this case, Anna Schultz had immigrated to the United States, to Wisconsin, and we had a family where we were able to document the marriage records, name the parents, and the censuses all worked. So we were pretty confident on the family structure, but we couldn't connect Anna to her parents. So in researching the DNA matches of the client, we found DNA matches who descended from four of the siblings. And we actually have um, over eight strong DNA matches to the client who formed this DNA shared match group. So this would give us the confirmation we needed that Anna is a descendant of Emanuel Schultz and his wife, Maria. When building out our family tree, we often run into the end of a line uh, at this point, DNA can be very helpful in identifying what locations we should focus our research in. For this Jarvis client, the documentary research got us back to William Jarvis, who was born in 1807 in Pennsylvania, but at that point we couldn't get beyond that. So I started with his closest matches, who had at least a small tree attached to their DNA, and I began to build out the shared match group. As you can see uh, across the bottom, each of these individuals share DNA with the client. As I started building up the tree of each of those DNA matches, I started noticing the Pennsylvania, Virginia location on several of the lines, which was a unique location. So I began focusing on my research there and as I built it out, I was able to find a common ancestor for four of the DNA matches. So the hypothesis is now that the William Jarvis, who is the client's great, great, great grandfather, is now a descendant of uh, some point along the way of John Jarvis of Halifax, Virginia. So it's important to watch for unique surnames or locations. Here is another example of using DNA to identify an unknown parent. The research question was, who were the parents of Sarah Marcus? So I started with the client's closest DNA match on that line and began to create a shared match group. And you can see along the bottom in the boxes at the very bottom, I put in the shared matches of each of those DNA matches to confirm that I had a shared match group a good solid genetic network. And as I build up the trees for each of those DNA matches, I found that that uh, the DNA match at the far right, Susan, she descends from Susanna Marcus, who's Sarah's sister. And fortunately, Susanna's marriage record named her parents. So I was able to confirm that William Marcus and Martha were the parents of Sarah. So one of the key takeaways is that DNA can lead us to more documents to research. It points us in the direction that the family's going and as we build out their fan club and find the DNA to confirm that, we can build those trees back further. So in summary on the DNA evidence, the first principle of evidence is that the more centimorgans a person shares with a DNA match, the closer the relationship is to them, and we can use that to help us confirm common ancestors. The second principle is that a DNA shared match group or a genetic network 
shares a common ancestor. And so as we build out the trees for those in our genetic network, we can begin to extend our lines back. So the third aspect on researching females that we need to be doing as, a, as we progress through our records is searching the female's ancestors, family, associates, and neighbors. And Elizabeth Schoen Mills coined this phrase, the fan club. And sometimes you'll also hear it called cluster research. And as we go through this cluster research section, we'll be using this research question that I had on my own line. It was, who was Nancy Polly's mother? And this is a document I have from my grandfather on the left. And I had her name and birth date, but I didn't have the names of her parents and no other information. So as I'm going through the fan club research process, you'll see in the right image that I was actually able to find her parents and then her maternal grandparents. So this map here of Youngstown is where Nancy Polly lived and it's a great example of the benefits of researching the fan club. For years, the only names that we recognized on this map were the two with the red arrows and we knew how those related and um, had spent some time researching them but couldn't get further back on the line. So as I researched the fan club, it revealed that the surnames that are in red boxes now on this map all belong to Nancy Polly's family. And in fact, the Polly, Watt, and Gibson families were also located in the records of Northumberland, Pennsylvania, where they were all living near each other. So who do we need to consider when we do cluster research? And that the answer is, is anyone who's listed in the ancestors records. And we group those into their family, associates, and neighbors. So for the family, that's going to include immediate family members, such as the direct line spouse, other spouses, children, parents, and siblings. And then we go on to the extended family and research them as well. The other group to consider in the family group is others who have the same surname who lived in the same locality. So for example, on census probate or land records in the same US county, we begin to find individuals that as we research them further, we can make connections and attach them into the family. So the associates in the fan club would be anybody who served as such as a witness, the informants on a death certificate or people who paid bond, the executors and others listed in probate records or people who had to sign affidavits for the military pensions. So we look at everybody who's associated with the ancestor to begin to extend out the fan club. And finally, we have the neighbors. Those are those who live nearby in a census uh, or land records, because often in earlier times, people would migrate in groups. So if we can identify a group in one location, such as I did in Ohio, and then I have that same group in Northumberland, Pennsylvania, that is evidence that I have the correct records in Pennsylvania. And often they turn out to be extended family and begin to, begin to find the connections. So again, in this example over on the left, it's a little bit small to read, but Agnes McCormick, who was a widow at the time, was Nancy Polly's mother and I find the other Polly family listed in these same records. So as you can imagine, as you start to research the fan club, that's a lot of people to research. So it's important to keep your records organized so you can do the analysis that you need on the records. It's important to find an organization system that works for the way you think. Um, this is one that I use and I know that others have used it as well. And by naming the individuals, the individual files as shown here, you can see that I start by making a letter for the alphabet and then within, for example, the letter M, I have each of the surnames that start with M. And then under that surname folder, I can create a folder for each individual. And for me, I've chosen to put the females under their maiden name. 
And then when I'm labeling the individual records, if I do their last name, first name, and their birth date, and then I can put the date of the actual record, you can see how it sorts all the file names for me in a timeline, <coughs> excuse me, timeline type of format. Another thing that really becomes important is keeping a research log. And um, over years of research, I can um, attest to the fact that keeping a research log will save you time in the long run. And then organizing your fan club record, probably my most important tool is the timeline that I create. I tend to use a spreadsheet because I can use it to facilitate the analysis I need by sorting and adding in the columns that I need. In this case, you'll see I added in a column for the known extended family, the possible extended family that I want to research further, and then his associates and neighbors. And then I also tried to include what their role was in the document. So the fan club process can be broken into four steps. And the first important thing to do is understand the locations and the jurisdictions where your ancestor lived. In many countries, especially in the earlier times, the jurisdictions and who would keep the records would change over time. So you can use Google, um, you can use other atlases and begin to understand where you might want to look for those records. Step two is you look at all of your ancestors' records and you take the time to add everyone in that was mentioned in any record and you put that into your timeline. You're going to want to include all the details and um, such as if they have listed an occupation or if they owned land or had a signature because these details may help you make the connections to other documents. Again, I also try to include what their possible, what their role in the document was in a possible relationship. Step three is now you need to prioritize what order you're going to research all of these people in. And I do that by using the criteria that was also provided by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. And she talks about the strength of the connection in the document. For example, a marriage witness is more likely to be family than the judge was who married them. You also want to consider how frequently a person shows up in the records. And finally, how reliable is the source? What's the quality? Was it just somebody's public member tree or do you have an original record that names these people? And then the fourth step is you begin researching from your prioritized list. And as you do your research, you're going to find more records and that's going to end up shifting your priorities. So you're going to revise your priorities and continue the research as you analyze the evidence. Here's a few examples of how fan club research can help to identify a maiden name. So in an ancestor's census household, the research, you're going to want to research people that have a different surname. And sometimes they're just lodgers, but other times they turn out to be the wife's family. Also, if you're doing especially like pre-1850 US research, you're going to check censuses for nearby families that had a female that was of the right age and also had the right first name, if you know that. And then watch the census record about the time of her marriage and see if she disappeared from the other census record. If you have a land deed and it's for a small amount of money or for a token such as an ear of corn, this may be from somebody that has a different surname, but that may end up being part of the wife's family. Also, I found that cemetery records that show plot layouts can provide other fan names for me to research because family members were often buried in the family plot. Finally, if a woman was single or widowed, sometimes she had a male relative that appears on the records because she had to need, uh, have a witness or some other signature on a document. One thing to point out and consider as you're looking at the fan club is often we're using indirect evidence to piece together multiple records. Um, 
direct evidence is something like this death certificate where the death date is stated outright. Uh, indirect evidence is where you're combining information from several records to support your conclusion. So let's look at an example. Uh, my research question was, I had an 1844 will in Pulaski County, Kentucky for Samuel Combest, and he listed his wife as Sarah. My question is, who were Sarah's parents? So I started by researching neighbors, and there was a Pulaski County tax list from 1803 where Samuel Combest and John Dick are both living on Fishing Creek. And I also had noticed there was a Pulaski County pension file from 1841 where Margaret Dick, who's the widow of John, lists uh, that Sarah's birth in 1778 was in Chester County, South Carolina. And for this pension file, she had actually torn out this Bible page to use as evidence that she should qualify for the pension. And so I have Sarah's birth date there. And then part of the indirect evidence I used is that Samuel and Sarah Combest had 10 children and three of them had these names, John Combest, Margaret Combest, and Samuel Dick Combest. So I felt pretty comfortable that I was researching the correct parents for Sarah. So to summarize the fan club, it it's, takes more time as you're doing your research, but when you get stuck on trying to extend your female lines, this is a great way to find other records that may either name your female ancestor or provide the indirect evidence you need to go ahead and put that family together. So you'll start by understanding the locality where she lived and then look at all the records of the family she's from that you're aware of and add those people into your fan club list. And once you've prioritized that list, you can start researching, see what other records you can find, and then re go ahead and reprioritize and continue your research. So now we come back to this concept that as you're researching women, you can see how doing these three steps may all be intermingled. As you search the correct records, you may need to add in some DNA evidence. You'll start to notice people in the fan club. And as you combine all three of these, you'll begin to find that your lines can get extended and you're comfortable with the documentation you've found. Thank you so much. This is amazing information. And we've actually had a lot of questions. Um, the first one comes from Jane Mitchell from Facebook, which is, what do you think of ancestry DNA separating the DNA from both parents, especially if parents are deceased? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I do. I love that feature. I use it all the time at work. Um, so I've read some different studies on how accurate it is. And Ancestry, of course, worked very hard to get it fairly accurate before they released the tool. Um, so far in the work I've done with it, I found it to be accurate, but I've not gone back four and five, six generations where the DNA gets a little harder to distinguish. Um, so I use it as a clue and I use it to start my research and I can start to separate out my DNA matches. Um, and though, even though, yeah, both parents might be deceased, they're using the DNA and they can do the shared match groups and all the science behind the scenes. And that's let them bucket them into the mother and father buckets. So yeah, very helpful. I, like, I do like that. Yeah, that is very helpful. Thank you for your thoughts on that. We have another question coming from Alinko22. This is from YouTube. Can my DNA tell me about traits I inherited from my mother? Yes and no. So it depends is the right answer. Some traits are um, have been identified by scientists to be attributed to certain genes on your DNA and your DNA. So I know some of the like Ancestry, 23andMe, and some of those have done more research onto the traits. Um, and there are some tools out there. The best thing to do on finding out which traits you can learn about is Google like ancestry DNA test and traits and see what people are saying about it. But that's how I research. When I have a new question pop up, I use Google and I put in as many terms as I, I can think of. And I find these great blog posts. It's uh, in the genetic genealogy community. People are really great about blogging. 
a lot of good answers out there. Awesome. That's a great tip. Thank you. Um, let's go to a question from Kaya Argyle on YouTube. Is there a DNA test you recommend? Yeah, we talked about that a little bit. Um, if we, if you go back and look at the chart on how many test takers there are, Ancestry DNA by far has the most. Um, I think it's over 23 million now. I don't have the chart in front of me. Um, some of the others are like 6 million. And so if the bigger the match pool, the more likely you are to find answers to your questions. So um, I don't endorse any one company. I don't get paid to endorse anybody, but I tend to test my family at Ancestry and then I upload their DNA to my heritage and to family tree DNA and to GEDmatch. And then I'm fishing in three ponds or four ponds for the price of one test. Um, the yeah. other thing is holidays is a good time to look for sales. So watch the holidays. They put out. That's a really good tip. Yeah. And definitely at Roots Tech every year, there's always great discounts on DNA kits too. If you want to come next year to our Roots yes, Tech, sure. which is February 29th to March 2nd. So very cool. Okay, let's go to one from Allison who says, how can mothers taking in foster children affect the records? Is it common to have written record as the mother, but is actually the foster mother after death? Um, that really depends on the time period. Uh, I find a lot of the research I do in the 1800s, people weren't as technical and there was a lot of adoption that happened again because, you know, a mother would die and family would take them in or a neighbor would take them in. And you're right. They don't always put foster mother. They just list mother. Um, that's one of the benefits of DNA is you have your genealogical tree and you have a biological tree. And so if you think about it, even if the mother that raised somebody is not biologically related. She still mothered them. And so in my mind, you can have several people who fathered you biological and socially. And, and so, um, so when I look at the records, like census records back in the earlier time periods, I do take them with a grain of salt. Yeah, that's an interesting case. We've seen recently that there's a lot of nonprofits. We had a few of them at Roots Tech connect our kids and DNA angels who actually use DNA to help children that don't know their biological family or want to find them either by fostering or just not knowing um, from birth. And it's been really amazing to hear their stories. We have some to share next month, actually. Yeah, DNA so angels coming. does a great service. Isn't it? They were telling us that they're, they've helped thousands of people find biological relatives, thousands. And it's, an all, it's a nonprofit service. It's so yeah. cool. I should have asked this one before because it relates to the question before, but how do you upload? I'm guessing that Nikki is talking about DNA. So Nikki, let me know if you're not talking about DNA, but how do you upload the DNA results to another site? Um, I use Google again and I say, how do I upload my heritage? to family tree DNA, or how do I upload an ancestry DNA test to, and they, all the websites, well, my heritage and family tree are the ones that allow uploads and they have great detailed answers for that because the sites change. And so I have to look it up each time and just say, what's the current steps? And yeah, they're really good at helping you through that process. Yeah, no, that's awesome. How far back can I trace using mitochondrial DNA? So mitochondrial DNA is a bit challenging to use. Um, it's both Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA are, have um, what they call ancient DNA paths that they help you, like your haplogroup will tell you your ancient origins. Um, but then if you have some closer mitochondrial DNA links or matches, it can help you especially rule out a particular line. So if you have a line in Tennessee that you think you're related to and you find somebody on that line that you can have take a mitochondrial test, and if you two do not show up in the same haplogroup, you know you're not related. Um, a lot of it just depends on who's tested on that line. So, but there oh, are, so uh, interesting. Roberta Estes has a great blog post on mitochondrial using mitochondrial DNA on her DNA explained. 
Oh, that's wonderful. And we'll make sure we put the link to that too. I have um, my colleague Rachel on the back end looking at any links that we can have. And by the way, um, the resources that you see here will be on the Roots Tech session page for download so that you can go there anytime and watch Julie's class and download the resources as well. So we also will have these sessions up after this. So if you didn't catch the live, don't worry. If you want to share it with somebody else, it'll still be up um, for this great knowledge and information that we've received today. So Julie, thank you so much for being with us. I have one last question that I'd love to ask okay. everyone. And you've spent so much of your life and time and energy and resources studying genealogy, DNA, and all of these things. What is your why? Why do you do it? What's your motivation? Um, I have found, well, I fell in love with family history because I heard the stories and saw the heirlooms. Um, but I find that family history brings connections. Um, I find it brings self-confidence to children. They love the stories. They can see that people went through hard things and that they can too. Um, and I love a good puzzle. You can't create a better detective game than family history. So I do love the challenge as well. I love that so much. That's so awesome. Thank you for sharing your knowledge.